Hello everyone! Today, we're going to take a deep dive into geology. A really deep dive. You see, there's a certain type of rock down there, which is hard to come by on Earth's surface. It's formed by immense pressures and temperatures beyond the experience of most humans. We call it a metamorphic rock. Of the three major rock types, metamorphic rocks are perhaps the most mysterious. They only form deep underground, or during extreme events such as meteorite strikes. The most basic, certain fact we know about them is that they are generated from pre-existing rocks. That is, one rock of any type is transformed into another rock. For instance, the sedimentary rock limestone can be transformed into the metamorphic rock marble. Any type of rock, whether it's sedimentary, igneous or metamorphic, can undergo this process under certain conditions. We call the process metamorphism, changing form. Here are some questions we need to consider. How does metamorphism actually happen? What does it take for one rock to change into another? Why is Thomas a different animal in every video? Well, Let's look into the first two questions, and maybe I'll answer the third later on. As you should know, rocks are made up of minerals, and the specific minerals within dictate the rock's properties. To transform one rock into another, you need to alter the minerals in some way. One way to do this is to change the structure or shape of those minerals. Every mineral holds a certain shape. We observe it in crystals. When exposed to high pressures or temperatures, the shape changes as the atoms making up the mineral are forced into a new arrangement. The mineral calcite, for example, makes up both limestone and marble. The difference between these rocks is that in marble, the calcite crystals have a different, more compact structure. They got this way by being compressed deep in the Earth's crust. Altering the chemistry of minerals also changes the rocks they make up. Every mineral has a unique chemical formula. For instance, the formula for the mineral albite is sodium aluminium silicate. It's possible to remove the sodium and add some calcium, which produces a different mineral called anethyte. Although mineral grains can undergo chemical changes like this, it's important to note that the composition of the whole rock is constant. Our original rock, known as the protolith, contains the same chemical elements as the final metamorphic rock. They have just been rearranged a bit. The rock also stays solid during metamorphism. Although it may be heated to hundreds of degrees Celsius, it doesn't melt. That would produce magma, which forms igneous rocks. If you want to know more about those, I have already covered them in separate videos. Your science teacher will probably have mentioned two main types of metamorphism. They are distinguished in terms of scale and the driving force behind them. First we shall look at contact metamorphism, which operates over relatively small scales. Then we'll look at regional metamorphism, which generates metamorphic rocks over a wide area. Contact metamorphism involves magma and the intense heat it generates. Magma is molten rock that rises up through the Earth's crust from below. If it rises high enough, it may break through the surface in a volcanic eruption. Along the way, magma has to push its way through pre-existing layers of rock, which we call country rock for convenience. Country rock surrounding the magma is exposed to temperatures that may be well over a thousand degrees Celsius. It is essentially baked, like a cake. This dramatic increase in temperature forces the minerals inside to adjust, which of course creates metamorphic rocks. Let's imagine that these layers are made of sandstone, a common sedimentary rock. Exposure to the magma body may transform it into quartzite, a metamorphic rock that is extremely durable and resistant to erosion. After sufficient weathering and erosion take place in this area, we can expect a hill of quartzite to stand out, next to a body of igneous rock from the magma itself. When you see an arrangement like this in the field, you can be sure contact metamorphism has taken place. I already mentioned that limestone can be converted into marble. 
This also happens during contact metamorphism. The shift from one rock to the other is driven by an increase in temperature. However, differences in the limestone protolith can also produce more exotic rocks. You may have heard of this one. It's lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. The rich blue colour is caused by a mineral called lazulite, and the flecks of gold are tiny pieces of pyrite. People have been mining it for at least 9,000 years to produce exquisite ornaments and pigments. So that's contact metamorphism in a nutshell. How about the other type, regional metamorphism? This process occurs over much larger areas and therefore produces large volumes of metamorphic rock. Regional metamorphism involves not only high temperatures, but also immense pressures. It occurs when pre-existing rocks are buried several kilometers below the surface. For example, sedimentary rocks forming under the ocean floor. In this case, the pressure comes from the weight of all that overlying rock and water. We also observe regional metamorphism in areas where two tectonic plates collide. The most prominent of these areas today sits on the boundary between the Indian and Eurasian plates. For the last 50 million years, they have been pushing together with enough force to raise the highest mountains on Earth, the Himalayas. Great pressure acting over a wide area produces metamorphic rocks such as slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. These particular rocks are most often formed by the alteration of minerals in mudstone or similar sedimentary rocks. They can be classified in terms of grade, with a higher grade corresponding to higher pressure and temperature exposure. All these rocks have a feature called foliation, which does not form in contact metamorphism. Foliation comes about when the minerals inside a rock are reoriented and flattened by the pressure being applied. In slate and phyllite, the lower grade metamorphic rocks, this foliation is not easily visible. Its influence, however, allows these rocks to be split into flat sheets parallel to the foliation. Sheets of slate produced in this way are used for roofing tiles and blackboards. In schist and gneiss, the higher grade rocks with a heap of pun potential, the pressure has actually caused different minerals to separate out in parallel layers. When you look at these rocks, you can see the foliation directly. This piece of schist has alternating white and grey layers. They are very thin, but you can still pick them out with the naked eye. Compare it with this piece of gneiss, in which the layers are quite thick. Any geologist could tell the white layers contain quartz, whereas the dark ones are rich in mica. Rocks formed by regional metamorphism are valuable because they tell us about conditions deep below the Earth's surface, a place us humans will probably never visit. Geologists keenly study them in places like the Indus River Valley, where the core rocks of the Himalayas are being eroded down. There is no bigger thrill than spotting a site like this and realizing it originated many kilometers beneath your feet. I should mention that other types of metamorphism are also possible. For instance, unique metamorphic rocks are formed inside subduction zones, where a tectonic plate sinks and gradually melts. That tectonic plate is usually made up of basalt, which is altered by pressure, temperature, and even water to form this colorful beast, eclogite. It contains such exotic minerals as red garnet, blue glaucophane, and green omphacite. This rock is rare on the surface and would make a worthy trophy for any metamorphic scientist. Time to wrap up! By now you should be comfortable comparing contact metamorphism and regional metamorphism, and describing some of the rocks formed by each process. You should also be able to explain how foliation is produced by regional metamorphism. That's about it for this video. More like this are on the way, so be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss out. Leave any questions, requests, or feedback in the comments below. Also, feel free to like and share the video. Every bit is helpful for me as a creator. Thank you for watching, and good luck with your studies!